Hey there, this is Paul Roberts. I'm the Editor-in-Chief at the Security Ledger, and we're here today to talk with Tim Bandos of the firm Digital Guardian, who's the author of a new book, new ebook, Stopping Cyber Threats, Your Field Guide to Threat Hunting. And uh, Tim's going to be talking with us about how to go looking for advanced cyber threats within your environment. Tim, welcome. Thank you. It's great Th seeing you. It's <clears throat> great seeing you. So before we get going and talking about the new ebook, um, just tell us a little bit about yourself and also the work that you do at Digital Guardian. Sure, absolutely. So I've been in the uh, cybersecurity industry for about 12 years now. Started off at DuPont, chemical manufacturing company. Mm, never heard of them. Okay. <laughs> 200 uh, plus year old company, right? Maybe Kevlar, Teflon, Tyvek, all the household names. Um, so started off there in their internal audit department, right? So vulnerability assessments, penetration testing, and then pivoted from there into the cybersecurity um, organization, focused on incident response and threat hunting. Um, so if you think about DuPont and all the trade secrets and intellectual property that we needed to protect, we were commonly targeted, right, by, by adversaries. So it was a huge role, um, and, and I think we were pretty effective at it. From there, I, I actually went over to Digital Guardian, um, DLP company. I head up our, our managed services for delivering uh, you know, advanced threat detection within customer environments. So uh, if you don't have the funding or the resources to do that type of activity, we have a, a team of, of analysts that, that can do that specifically for your environment. So um, this new ebook, again, is called Stopping Cyber Threats. Um, one of the things I think that's interesting is it's about threat hunting, um, but you make a distinction between the act of threat hunting, so looking for a particular uh, attack or um, malicious software that might be operating in your environment, and incident response. Um, talk a little bit about what the distinction is, because some people might yeah. say, oh, well, threat hunting, that, he's just talking about incident response, but you say they're actually two different things. Yeah, there's definitely a, a difference in, in incident response and, and threat hunting. Incident response is really uh, having a set of formalized procedures uh, in an effort to classify you know, a security event or something occurring within your environment and how you respond methodically to that, right? And who, who all is involved, right? Who, you know, who needs to make those calls? Who is the decision maker for those incidents? Whereas threat hunting is really the, the precursor to incidents. Right? It's the ability to go out and identify an incident before it's even occurred in the first place. So you're actively seeking out threats within your organization. Okay. Okay. Back in the day, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, finding threats wasn't particularly difficult if you got infected with uh, SoBig or MS Blaster or SQL Slammer. We were talking about SQL Slammer right. before. <laughs> It wasn't that subtle. Uh, right. You know, your SQL server basically became inoperative. So it was pretty easy to figure out what was infected and Absolutely. what the cause was. Not so much the case these days, I'm guessing. Yeah, those were the easy days, right? When, <laughs> when it's triggering all your IPS and, and firewall alerts. Uh, nowadays, <clears throat> you're essentially searching for the unknown. You know, things that are going on with your environment that mask, um, you know, malicious behavior with, you know, normal behavior, mm -hmm. right? It looks like a common and maybe administrator within your environment moving laterally within your, your organization. So it's very difficult these days to identify when you have threats a lot of times because they might not always be using malware, you know, common signatures that might be detected by antivirus solutions. Right, so they attempt to blend in within your company's you know traditional type activity in order to to reach their goals. Right. So when we're talking about threat hunting, and I mean you go into this in the ebook, what's the skill set? What are the what are the requisite skills that you need to be able to? Um, figure out what is attacking you, not just the fact that you've been attacked. Right. I, I think it starts with at least having a passion for cybersecurity. I think anyone who is a, you know, a true security practitioner, you know, they stay on top of emerging threats. They're constantly reading blogs and, and really identifying the latest tactics, you know, techniques, how adversaries are getting into organizations. Right. So just, I think, at, at the base is just having a passion for it. Right. And then the second part is maybe even just having a little bit of experience and knowledge in that, uh, contextual awareness and knowledge within your environment. Uh, I remember an incident one time where we saw you know, a, a particular account being leveraged across our network to a segment that they weren't supposed to be in. Right? Right. So that, that's an outlier uh, from my perspective, but may, many people might not have picked up on that just because they didn't have the contextual awareness. Yeah, you talk so. about enterprise knowledge in the right. ebook. Is that kind of what you're referring that's to? That's exactly what I'm referring to, enterprise knowledge, you know, having an ability to, to really just know your environment, you know, mm -hmm. what makes sense, um, and then really kind of driving down and having kind of a forensic background as well. I think that's a key uh, skill set to have when we talk 
talk about threat hunting. Many people are in a position to make hiring or staffing decisions or saying, man, you're talking about somebody who can reverse engineer malware or do very sophisticated types of um, network investigations or crawl around in cyber criminal forums. I can't find or afford anybody like that. Yeah, no, so, so yeah, that would require probably a pretty large team, right? Um, you know, to have a specialized skill set like reverse engineering of malware. So basically what I did was I formed relationships and partnerships with other organizations in the threat intelligence community, um, and we relied upon them in certain scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. Having a trusted, you know, confidant, an individual that you can maybe reach out to and say, hey, can you take a look at this piece of code? You know, that's how you, that's how you kind of combat that issue of affording um, something that you, you ultimately can't pay for internally, but you can outsource it. Um, there's also a managed services that you can leverage upon. Um, Digital Guardian, we have a managed service for that as well. So if there's specimens or, or code that you know you can't necessarily deconstruct internally, um, you know you can pass it along to that third party. Uh, you talk in the ebook that you wrote about the importance of getting um, buy-in from the uh, top executives in the company, the C-suite, if you want to call it that. Um, so I'm guessing at, at DuPont, that wasn't necessarily an easy sell. This is a company that's in the business of making chemicals and, uh, you know, in industry, not particularly um, a cyber firm. Um, so how do you make that sale to the C-suite of saying we need to invest time and resources, not just in defending against threats, but actually investigating compromises or incidents that might happen yeah. in our environment? That's a great question. I think a lot of organizations can relate to that. Um, you know, getting executive buy-in for something that maybe they don't feel like they need to spend money on. Um, at DuPont, it was a little bit easier just because we didn't let that incident go to waste. It was our initial incident. When you have a big incident within your company, it's important to identify how they got in, you know, where they went, what are they targeting, and present that and say, you know, this is these are our gaps within our organization. You know, this is where, you know, we fell down from a technology perspective, a people perspective, perspective. Um, and this is what we need to kind of take us there to the next level. So anytime we had an issue or an event within our company, we made sure we did a root cause analysis, right? Mm -hmm. We documented all of that. And that's why it's important to have an incident response process. You know, how, how do you respond to those types of threats? And then how do you document it afterwards and make sure that you're reporting it to the top? So I think it's important to have relationships with the C-level executives um, and, and just, you know, have an, an open dialogue and open communication, regularly check in, provide them metrics on, you know, how the program's, you know, effectively uh, working today versus, you know, maybe how it worked, you know, a couple years ago or a couple months ago. So it's so always keeping like a report card in check, essentially. And what's the argument in terms of them saying, well, what, what's the return on investment here if I'm going to invest in people, technologies to go chasing after and trying to figure out what this thing is beyond the fact that it, we, we know we have it? Um, what am I going to get for that? Yeah, I think I think looking at it from that perspective isn't necessarily the, the right approach. I think you need to look at it from a cost avoidance perspective, uh -huh. um, a reputation impact perspective. So uh -huh. if you get breached and it's being reported out into the news, I mean, you could see how it affected Sony or Home yeah, Depot. Sure, you know your shares could go down. So you're talking about? I mean, you were at Digital Guardian now before you were at Dupont. I can imagine companies out there saying. Yeah, sure, Dupont. You've got intellectual property, uh, trade secrets worth hundreds of billions of dollars that you've invested, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to yeah. develop. Sure, you know you're 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 going to be a big target. You're going to have a big bullseye on you um, from competitors, from nation states, and so on. Um, but me, I just work at a little company that does you know fill in the blank. Um, right. So maybe I don't need to worry so much. True. Uh, wishful uh, I, thinking? What? No, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think part of it is true, but at the same point, I can argue that a lot of times third parties might even be leveraged as an entrance vector into maybe another organization. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. if you have a manufacturing facility with a bunch of other companies that are partners with them, right, they leverage those as entrance vectors. Um, so I think it's important regardless, you know, across your entire, you know, supply chain that those organizations are also being protected, you know, so those larger companies have a stake in their security controls as well. So it's extremely important, you know, if you're at a C level, you need to ask those kinds of, of questions when you go into those partnerships. You know, what do you do from a cybersecurity perspective? Right. How would you respond? How do you identify when there are threats? So I think it's a very important question regardless of where you work. Yeah. So you actually were talking earlier and you were telling kind of a story about uh, that happening within a company where you worked, where there was a breach, a result that uh, originated, sorry, with a third party IT contractor. Um, <clears throat> it got me thinking that in many, particularly in large organizations, often the environment, the IT environment, is kind of a series of, of fiefdoms. Maybe they're, it's under the control of a different group within a company or even right. a contractor, an outside contractor, and, and they're kind of you know, dotted lines, you know, don't, don't cross this. 
how do you, if you're doing threat hunting where you need to follow the trail where it leads, right? Um, how do you negotiate that? And, and what do you do when the, yeah. the trail leads up to the third party contractor and, and you're sort of standing there saying, well, this is probably where it came from. Right, and that, that once it comes down to building relationships with those third party contractors, um, because when those trails lead to that organization, they're not necessarily gonna be so open to, to provide you logs and forensics and you know images right. of the machines because right. they're working on other customer accounts as well. So a lot of that's you know confidential to them. Um, and it's also kind of a slap in their face if we're reporting to them you know that they were the source of the attack so I think it's important to once again establish those relationships with those individuals within that organization the people who are in the IR functions the threat intelligence you know communities because you can kind of have that back and forth dialogue like right. hey we're seeing this on our end what are you saying so it's really that sharing of indicators and um, you know kind of collaborating with one another so you don't want that first point of contact to be in the context of uh, we think that we got hacked through you you want it you want there to be relationship there in place before you ever have that conversation. Right. I mean, in, in our particular scenario, uh, you know, the case that we went through, unfortunately, it wasn't there. I had to establish, you know, those partnerships. And today, he's currently my best friend, which right. is kind of ironic. And right. um, so, so really, so is it know, like, let me take you out for beers right, right. And after a couple Starts beers. at that. <laughs> then you start <laughs> sharing indicators. Hey, can you get your guy to take a look at this? Um, that's really how it begins, you know, right. and I think it's important anyways, you know, just to just to, you know, develop those relationships regardless. Right. Know? Right. Um, and, and obviously we've seen like in the, just in the headlines, obviously we know that the, you know, the target breach uh, came by way of a, a third party contract. So this is a, this is a fairly common vector, yeah. particularly for large companies. Um, you might have a good, good grasp on your internal IT processes and assets, but uh, if you've got somebody who's uh, got a link into your environment for whatever purpose that can be um, exploited. Um, so you talk about um, using or, or consuming threat intelligence um, from various sources uh, as part of the threat hunting process. Threat intelligence obviously is a big buzzword these days in the information security space. There are a lot of companies offering different forms of threat intel. Um, how valuable is it? Uh, are there kind of qualities or grades of threat intelligence? Is it all useful? Um, what what, what yeah. should uh, folks who are reading this or, or seeing this video or reading your book know about how to evaluate the val how to evaluate threat intelligence? So I think threat, the topic of threat intelligence is is tough for me. I, I think um, you know there's certain types of feeds that you can get, and a lot of them are even open source, right? So how how high fidelity are those threat intelligence indicators within your organization is really the question you need to ask. So if you're paying for that, you need to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from from our perspective, any incident that we had within our organization. None of the indicators, you know, the domains, you know, the command and control infrastructure, the you know, the file names that we're executing in malware, none of those actually linked up with any of our intel sources, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why building your own internal intelligence, I think, is is super important. It's imperative, really, uh, and retaining that. But then also, you know, relying upon so, you know several threat intelligence feeds for context, right? Because they get a lot of those low hanging fruits. Because a lot of times within your company, if you have everything going into sim, you might have a ton of noise. You know, yeah. it might be a bunch of alerts. You might have a botnet within your organization. You know, is that that state sponsored versus gardenware variety is what right. we, we typically coined it. Um, so I think it's important to be able to, to kind of weed through um, you know, that noise uh, to be able to really identify when you have you know, an actual incident. So that's, why, that's how we leverage third party threat intelligence feeds. Okay. Yeah. You've said that your own company is best is, is more or less your or your own environment is your best source of, of threat intelligence. Totally. Um, from from every single incident that we had, you know, retaining all that intelligence that you derived out of that particular investigation. That's why it's important to have a forensic guy, you mm -hmm. know, because whenever you're analyzing a machine or a system, you want to capture as much information that you can off of mm -hmm. that and, and then applying those signatures, you know, going forward. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's how you know whether or not, you know, the threat actor potentially is back in within the, you know, the environment. What you're doing is you're essentially building a profile, you know, the tactics, techniques, procedures, they, they commonly refer to as TTPs. Right. Um, that, that's, that, that's how you develop that information. And you talk about also, in addition to, to that type of, of uh, resource, you talk about ways to use open source tools. You mentioned SIP to do uh, things like uh, security information uh, management, right? Um, so what, what tools out there? Because again, you, I think one of the big points you make in the book is that threat hunting um, and maybe IR by extension, incident response, don't have to be expensive endeavors that you can do it even with a, a small budget. 
um, and, and get good results. Right, and, th and that's really the intention of the book is, is to kind of lay out a framework for you know, organizations or companies who don't necessarily have that money to spend. I think one of the, the first starting points for any company that wants to get into threat hunting is having a centralized repository of your logs you know, coming in, so, okay. so having a SIM, right? And SIMs can be expensive. Um, so there are free solutions out there, right? Like, like you mentioned, Elk, the Elk stack, the Elasticsearch, Kibana. Um, you know, pairing that up and ingesting your data into that particular stack will provide you the ability to, to look across disparate sources of information, right? Uh -huh. And identify when you might have something within your environment. So I think the starting point is just getting the logs, right? Mm -hmm. And then pivoting from there. Mm -hmm. And is that common these days? I mean, in your experience, are you still seeing a lot of companies that aren't um, using their logs to understand what's going on within an environment or, or, or just overwhelmed by the amount of data that, that they're that they're receiving. Yeah, I mean, I think companies are, are starting to get it. I think yeah. they are moving more towards that. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's that overwhelming feature, right? Right. Having that level one triage guy to kind of pilfer through all that noise and tell you what your, you know, your true infections are or your alerts, that's very difficult, right? You right. need someone maybe experienced or you need a technology that can help, you know, sift through, you know, that right. noise. Um, so I, I definitely think it's a problem, and I, I think there are solutions, though, um, that can kind of combat you know, that, that particular area and, and really let you know when you have those high-fidelity indicators or alerts within your environment. Right. I mean, one of the challenges is, even if you've got the tools set up, right, so you're collecting the data you need to, is understanding or developing a sense for when something is a red flag and when something isn't, right? Because potentially you could spend all day, every day right. going down going rabbit down, holes. Going down yep. rabbit holes, yep. looking at you know what you think might be indicators of compromise but are but are benign. Um, you talk in the in the ebook um, about developing an instinct for when things are awry or when something bears more investigation. Um, how do you how do you get that instinct? How do you develop that? How yeah. do you develop that? And what is that? You spend a lot of time like? in those rabbit holes, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> I think it's it, when, yeah. it's an instinct thing, right? It's like any maybe good detective, right? If we relate yeah. it to an outside world, you know, a detective on his first day isn't going to have those instincts necessarily to identify you right. know, when there's a, a bad guy and, you know, kind of linking all those pieces of evidence together. Mm -hmm. um, so over time, you develop them, uh, you know, and, and you, then you have the ability to kind of see, you know, different pieces of information and pair them together and, and say, okay, this relates to this and, you know, this shouldn't occur. It's really kind of coming up with hypotheses as well. You know, asking yourself questions. You know, maybe I'll go out in my environment and look at all you know command line activity being spawned from command shell, right? Mm -hmm. And then you look at those rare frequencies, right, of the command line that are executing, and you kind of identify within there. So that's a component of cyber threat hunting, right? And it doesn't mean you have to reverse engineer malware to do threat hunting. It can be just as easy as something like that, right? Just looking at the data, looking at rare instances of something occurring within your environment. But you need to come up with those questions and those hypotheses about your environment, you know? I mean, one of the challenges that organizations have with these, I mean, we at the beginning of the talk, we, you know, we, we talked about, in the, you know, in the old days, it, it wasn't hard to know that you had Blaster or Slammer or some other so big or some other big noisy worm. Right. These days, the emphasis often is on, unless it's ransomware, uh, the emphasis is on stealth and, and persistence and moving laterally within an organization, mm -hmm. so moving from lower value assets to higher value assets. But I'm, my guess is one of the problems that companies have is even if you've identified what you think is a threat, remediated it, um, how do you get comfortable that you've got everything, right? That you've actually cleaned your environment of whatever this threat yeah. is and that you're no longer at risk? Yeah, that's another great question. So uh, once again, it comes back to forensics, right? So when you've identified a machine that is infected with some sort of state-sponsored you know, threat activity, um, the question you need to ask is, is that ground zero? You know, is this where they, they came in? Identifying your entrance vector of how they got in is important. Because then from there, you can kind of sprawl out and see every single machine that they went to after uh -huh. the fact, right? So once you build out this map and a picture of every machine that they went to, then you have to go out and remediate all those machines. You have to right. reset your usernames and passwords because they most likely, you know, dump those credentials within your environment. Um, so you need to go through that whole incident response process. And to be honest, you know, the way that we got comfort that they were fully, you know, out of our environment was seeing them come in the next time, 
right? So it was kind of, I kind of had that feeling, okay, I think we were successful. You know right. what I mean? So you might not ever know, right, that you're 100% on. In other words, seeing them come back. Seeing them come back. So, right. and really their turnaround time might be a two to three month, right, uh -huh. as they stand up domain infrastructure, code new tools. Um, after we went through our neutralization effort, we were pretty confident, but you can't be 100%, uh -huh. you know what I mean? But forensics can at least answer a lot of those questions. You know, wh right. where are all those web shells? Where are all those, you know, pieces of, of malware communicating out to? You know, putting all those blocks in place. But ultimately, it wasn't until, you know, they attempted to come back in when you knew, okay, we were successful last right. time. Let's on to the next one. They wouldn't you know, be trying to break in. Yeah, absolutely. Off, right. so. Uh, so folks talk a lot about um, kind of layer eight, right? The, the human problem yeah. in, in breaches. And I'm sure in your experience, often um, it is employees um, who, are the, who are the patient zero in these breaches. Either it's a phishing email or, or malicious website kind of... Um, um, watering hole attack or right. something like that that might be the initial uh, entry point to your environment. Um, how do you um, factor that into your investigations? And um, obviously, in, in the long term, how do you how do you deal with that? How do you protect against yeah. that happening again? Um, even if you've removed a threat. Um, just to sort of say, we, we feel confident that this is going to get in again. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we would commonly refer to that as, as the weakest, you know, chink in our arm or the weakest link in the chain. Um, you know, you can spend a ton of money on education and awareness and security awareness. And I think there, there needs to be elements of that, right, within your overall program, making sure, you you know, you educate your end users. But we can't rely on end users to do the right thing all the time. I mean, right. we're, you know, although we might be technical, we take a lot of things for granted. You know, someone in finance might not operate a PC like we do on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, looking for cyber threats, and they, they might just not understand malware in general. Um, even just the clicking of links and non-attachments, you'd think that would be, you know, uh, something that they would be a lot more cautious about. But regardless, anytime we had, a, you know, a phishing campaign come through, you know, 60, 70 percent, you know, might not have clicked on it, but that 30 percent that did, you know, that, that's all it took. Yep. Even just one person clicking on it, that's all it literally takes. So right. I think it's combating it with, you know, that security and awareness, but also some technology, right? There's some, some really great technology out there that can prevent, you know, even the execution of after clicking on that link, you know, where did it go? You know, did it go out to, a, you know, a, a, an IP address directly? Did it pull down an executable? There's technologies that you can look at, even Digital Guardian, where it looks at that behavior and it can stop that and prevent that. Or even just the clicking on the link, you can pop up a, you know, a prompt to say, are you sure you want to click on this link? This is where you're going. You know, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll mask, you know, the true link of, of, of where it might actually be, you know, kind of headed to. So, so even that really helps, I think, as, uh, you know, from an end user perspective, you know. Okay, so the new book is called Stopping Cyber Threats, Your Field Guide to Threat Hunting. And folks, obviously, you can get it from Digital Guardian's website. It's good for them to read or they, they're, they're, they're the right audience if what? They're the right audience if they're in that security seat, regardless of what hat they're wearing within the, their security organization. Um, I think it's important just to be aware, right, mm -hmm. that there are threats out there. Um, whether you think that you're targeted or not, it's just important to at least arm yourself with some of that knowledge, you know, have an incident response process in place, and do some cyber threat hunting on the side, mm -hmm. you know, just, just to actively go out and seek, you know, do we have maybe any incidents within our company? Um, so I think it's, it's a wide audience, right? And even C-level execs should understand, you know, what are their responsibilities as well, you know, from that perspective. Right. You know, do I need to provide funding to, to those lower security groups, you know, to, to kind of combat this issue? So, so absolutely, I think it's pretty much anyone. <laughs> okay, great. Tim, thanks so much for coming in and talking to me in the Security Ledger. Yep, I absolutely. I enjoyed it anytime. Tim Bandos is the Senior Director for Cybersecurity at Digital Guardian, and the new ebook that he has out is Stopping Cyber Threats, Your Field Guide to Threat Hunting.